Miles, but I wanna, wanted to kind of walk back closer to the, the younger adults, the students here, as we begin this morning. I, 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 the Lord found me, and, and praise him, I found my salvation at the young age of about 13. Uh, but I, I, didn't, I, I didn't have church on my mind and on my heart very much. I went, but that was about it. Didn't grow much and went away to college, went from Louisville to Murray State. And uh, uh, it was between my freshman and sophomore years that we, uh, a group of us in Louisville, living in the Hikes Point area, every night, and there were, there were five to ten of us that would get together, and every night we would do something that young adults should not do we would go out and go drag racing. Now remember, this was, the, this was the summer. Eric, don't laugh at me. This was the summer of 68. This was the time of supercars, GTOs and Chevelles. I had a GTO. And every night, about midnight or one o'clock, we would leave Hikes Point Frishes and we would parade way out past J-Town where there was a one mile long stretch of highway on Billtown Road. And one, uh, one night, we all started out there. I was not driving that night. I was riding in the front seat of a car. And we got to the, got to the stoplight uh, about 100 yards from the Frishes, where we hung out in those days, drive-in restaurants. We got to the stoplight, and, and I told the driver, I said, I'm, I'm not going to go with you all night. I'm just, I need to go home. I got out of the car Went back, to, walked back to the restaurant, got in my car, drove home. My mother was an educator. She was a reader. She would stay up to all hours of the night reading. I walked in the back door, and there she was at the kitchen table. She said, what are you doing home so early? And this was about 12, 30, 1 o'clock. Now I want you all to know I'm not proud of this phase of my life, but it is what it is, and I was a human long before I was a pastor. So I, I, I walked in and went upstairs and went to bed, and I couldn't go to sleep that night. And, and I, we lived about 50 yards from the Watterson Expressway. I couldn't go to sleep, and I, uh, a couple hours later, I began to hear sirens, one after another, going down the expressway. And I thought, this is strange this hour of the night. I wonder what in the world's going on. About 30 minutes later, I got a phone call, and this was long before the days of cell phones. I had an old rotary dial phone there beside my bed upstairs. Phone rang, and I immediately picked it up, and it was a good friend. And there had been a horrible accident there at the finish line of the drag race that night. Uh, one of the drivers had lost control, and two of my closest friends were sitting on the trunk of a car at the finish line, and the car that lost control at 100 miles an hour plus plowed into those two guys sitting on the trunk of that car, and, and one of them was killed, and the other one was near death. I got in my car, drove down to the hospital, and uh, shortly thereafter, the, the second, these were the, among the, the five or seven best friends I had on earth, and within a matter of minutes, with our careless practices as young adults, two of them lost their lives. And it was, it was the most devastating, difficult tragedy in my life even to this day. Uh, I, I can remember, the, I, I couldn't sleep for days. I would see one of the young men flying through the air. The, when the car hit him, it drove him about 125 feet, and he landed in a, a creek bed there beside a little church, Fisherville Baptist Church. So it, I, I, I think back, to those days, the reason I tell that story, I'm getting to experiencing God, but here's, here's what happened as a result of that accident. I, I began to wonder why God spared me on that particular night, because that was the only night of the summer up till that point in time that I had not been there drag racing with my friends. We, we went out we went out every night. It's the first night I hadn't been there. And it was, I, I didn't know when my mother said, what are you doing home, Surly? I, my only answer was this. I just had a feeling not to go tonight. Have you ever had one of those feelings? Is it the Spirit of God? I don't know. I, I didn't even think about it being the Holy Spirit in those days. But I do remember this. I began to ask God 
more frequently than ever, particularly at those funeral services that were packed out with friends and, and students. I began to ask God this question. You spared me that night. You must have a plan and purpose for me. And, and, and I look at you students and, and I, I, I think, I, I wish I had had an experiencing God opportunity when I was your age. And let me pose some questions, not merely to the students here, but to all of us, regardless of our age this morning. Listen to these questions. What if, these are what if questions. What if you could really hear when God is speaking to you? What if you could really clearly identify his activity in your life? And I look around the whole room. The questions are not limited to these that are young. What if you could truly believe him to be and to do everything that he promises to do? Would that interest you? What if your belief could move you to a constant willingness to adjust your life to his plans? Now, depending on your age, for some of you that are here, you're you really not too interested in making any adjustments at this point in your life. But oh, you young people, people that, that have such a life ahead of you to fall into lockstep with God's work and God's will. I, I wish I had known then what I finally discovered decades later. What if you grew to be able to recognize a direction he is taking your life and identify what he wants to do through you? Our oldest daughter in our first church traveled to Belarus with 35 students from the University of Kentucky. She was in high school, and we supported Campus Crusade there in, uh, in Benton. And she went with 35 college students to Belarus, spent five years of her life, and it changed the direction of her life. And she ended up in the mission field for a few years. Recognize the direction. What if you could clearly know what you need to do in response to God's activity in your life? What if, church, what if you could clearly know how to respond to God's activity in your life? And friends, young friends and old friends, that's what experiencing God is all about. Regardless of our life stage, I started through the workbook this week. I have got a stack of Experiencing God workbooks somewhere. I do not know where they are. They're in a box. Every time I leave one church and go to another, I move box after box after box. I did not move my books to this church because uh, I'm tired of going and picking them up. But somewhere I've got a big stack of Experiencing God books. But I started this week through a new one. And from the moment I started to answer the questions and let the Spirit of God engage me through his word, I was reminded again how under the power of the Holy Spirit, Experiencing God meets us just where we are regardless of our season of life. Now, if, if the what, regard, regarding the what if questions, if none of that interests you on those what ifs, if you all don't care anything about that regardless of your youthful age, then don't do experiencing God. But if it does interest you, come go with us. As Brad said, it's not too late. I'm going to be preaching not what you're doing doing week by week, but I am going to be preaching thematically in support of what we're doing as a church. Now, thus far, I think, given the fact that some of you are doubling up, I think we're somewhere around 100, maybe a slightly more going through it, but I would love to see more of you walk with us together as a church. I'm going to be preaching for the next three or four months on these themes. 
identifying God's activity in our lives, believing him to be everything that he's promised. But more than that, believing that he is indeed able to do everything that he has promised he will do. Oh, that our belief would lead us to a willingness to make whatever adjustment we must make in order to join him in what he is doing. Willingness to make adjustments, not forced adjustments, but that we would be willing to make adjustments in our life, even in the way we do church. Ouch. Might we need to make some adjustments, brothers and sisters, in the way we're doing church? I would argue as a short-term guy, without question, we need to make some adjustments. Some of you would agree, some of you would disagree with me. You may like it the way it is, but we're going to go through experiencing God together, and let me urge you, come go with us over the next three or four months. Jesus said, Jesus said in John chapter 10 in the 10th verse, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full, more abundantly. Wouldn't you like to live the life of which Jesus speaks all the way to the full? The answer for most of us is yes. However, the caveat is, Lord, I want to experience you to the full, but please, please, please don't ask me to make any serious adjustments in my life. I want to experience all that you have for me, but, but, but I don't want anything to change. I don't want to make any changes in my life. You see, that's a caveat that many of us put on an affirmative answer. But oh, that we would be willing to adjust our lives in order to experience Christ to the fullest. The seven tenets of experiencing God, we go through these. We'll look at them every week. God is always at work around you. Everywhere you go, there is nowhere you cannot go that God is not at work. And if you're here this morning, you're not sure of the relationship. God didn't bring you here this morning merely to be engaged by the worship and music or by his word. He brought you here because he is in passionate pursuit of a love relationship with you. And he loves you as you are. He loved me that night. Should, I have, should we have been out there drag racing every night? No, 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 it was wrong. It was dumb. It was stupid. And I don't allow my kids, that was the S word in our home. I didn't allow them to say that word, so it just kind of came out. But it was. Call it what it is. Sooner or later, somebody was going to get hurt. And the dynamic of our close circle of friends was changed forever as a result of our carelessness. But God's brought you here this morning for a purpose, if you don't know him. And that's to hear the good news of Jesus Christ that the God who pursues you in love sent his son from heaven to earth to walk among us, to ultimately die on the cross, to pay for your sins and for mine. A basket full of sins. God is in pursuit. His son died for you. He rose from the grave and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. One of the hymns I listened to driving down here today, there is a fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Jesus Christ shed his blood. That's how much God is in pursuit. Did anybody ever die for you other than Christ Jesus? Thirdly, God invites you. He invites me. He invites us, church, to become involved with him in his work. Fourthly, the way God speaks today. Scripturally speaking, God speaks by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit communicates through the Bible and prayer and circumstances and, yes, even the church. And what the Spirit is doing is revealing God himself, 
his purposes and his ways. We're going to begin this morning with a, 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 a glimpse into the life of Abram. Abram who became Abraham. It's the story of how God was working in another of the Old Testament characters to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. And then this, as I continue to remind you, this is, this is where we get some dropout and fallout. God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you. I don't want to say us, leads you. This is very personal. Leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. I met with the deacons, your deacons this morning. We didn't get too far, but I'm laying the track for a call to action. We're at a point we need to do something. That's why we're doing experiencing God. It's going to require faith. It's going to require action. And number six, you must make major adjustments in your life in order to join God in what he is doing. And lastly, that's how we come to know God by experience as he accomplishes his work through us. I want you to hear me carefully. I'm not saying that God is not accomplishing his work through us even right now. I'm saying he could be accomplishing a great deal more in the months and years that are ahead. Our text this morning is God's call of Abram to become Abraham. Now, I want to caution us this morning. We're back in the Old Testament. We've gone from Nehemiah all the way back to Genesis. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis 12. You may think, well, Pastor we, we studied Nehemiah, and now you may be thinking, here we are in Abraham. Abraham had a unique, a very special relationship with God. I agree 100%. Abraham had a special assignment from God. I agree with that. And you may be thinking, well, that's not for us as followers, as New Testament followers of Jesus Christ. And I would strongly argue with you on that basis. I believe that's the wrong perspective to take. I believe that the story of Nehemiah and the story of Abraham is God's revelation of himself to you and to me of the way he works. I think when we look at the life of Nehemiah, when we consider the life of Abraham, God is revealing the way he works. Were those unique characters in the Old Testament without question? But still, the Spirit of God reveals to us through the Bible in these stories how God goes about his work. And the call of Abram is most assuredly relevant to experiencing God and the way he works. If you have your Bibles, Genesis 12, verse 1, let's stand together, read the first three verses. Stand, if you will, if you are able in honor of the reading of God's Word. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Let's pray. God, open our hearts if they're not already opened. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, we plead with you, we beseech you on this morning in which we've gathered together to worship, praise you, and to consider your word. God, stir our hearts, teach us about the ways you work, and convict us, Lord, more than teach us, convict us Give us the desire to more fully experience you regardless of where we are in life, from the very young to the very old. In Christ's name we come. Amen. We're dealing with the call of Abraham. At the, call, at the time of the call, it was still Abram. What is happening leading up to this text, uh, uh, unlike previous 
uh, narratives in Genesis, that, in Genesis that trace the movement of sin through God's people and the corruption of man that led to the flood. We now come right before this passage to the Tower of Babel. It's the story of people attempting to distort God, the people of Babel are confused about who God is. They are, they are falling prey to what we would call pagan polytheism, the multiple gods, the worship of many, many gods. And the Tower of Babel that was to be built was clearly an attempt by the people to make a name for themselves. And thus God must reveal himself anew. So out of the Babel experience, as a result, God is preparing to give birth to a nation. A nation that they would revere and honor his name and take his name to the world, to reach the world. The Lord in that first verse says to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go, go to the land I will show you. No, note here, don't miss this. All God told Abram about his final destination, all he told him was that he would show it to him. His instruction, leave and go. Leave and go. But it wasn't merely leaving and going like we would go on a trip. It was leaving his country it was leaving his people. It was leaving the security of his father's household. And do we realize the significance of what God is asking of Abram? Can you imagine? Can you personally imagine? Have you ever experienced such a clarion call of God to step out and follow him, leaving your security and your family? Leave and go. Simple instruction with a profound implication to leave such security. Some of you here this morning can relate to this text. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household. A clarion call. But God's not done. He then gives a startling promise. After giving his instruction, he gives Abram the promise. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And I'll go farther than that. I will make your very name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So the situation is this, Abram right off the bat, at the beginning of experiencing God, if you will, Abram finds himself at the point of a crisis of belief. God has given him an instruction, stronger than an invitation, he's told him to leave and go. But Abram finds himself at a crisis of belief. And his response so Abram left. As the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. The promise God has given him, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you, make your name great and you will be a blessing. The promise no doubt remembered Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree. I'm in verse 6 of Morah at Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land and the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. 
You see, the God of glory appeared to Abraham in this text. In the midst of an idolatrous world culture that was permeating the area, God appeared. Scholar, I read this week, anyone who closely encounters the one true God of glory knows instinctively and immediately that none is like him. The prevailing trend was polytheism, but God, of course, monotheistic, one God. Belief and worship in one God only. Have you ever encountered, have you ever had an up-close and personal encounter with the one true God of whom we read this morning? Don't answer casually. It's a serious question. Do you know him? Have you had an encounter, not like Abram, but an experience so clear and vivid that you knew something, someone, the God of gods was working in your heart and in your life? Verse 8 From there, Abram went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And once again, there he built an altar to the Lord. And he did something different this time that had not been done. He called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Now there comes a famine in the land, verse 10. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. Here's the picture. Abraham has an encounter with God. The instruction is clear. Leave and go. What does Abram do? He leaves and goes. One might tend to think that such obedience to God would bring with it, particularly with the promises, that the sailing would be smooth and all would be good. It's all good, as we like to say today. No, 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 no. Not the case. Abram and his people encounter a famine. Hard for us to understand the impact of a famine because most of us have never experienced anything like it, though perhaps there are some here that have in other parts of the world. There's a famine, and they have to leave. They have to continue to travel, and they go down to Egypt. So what happens when they get where God is leading them? It doesn't work very well, and they're hungry, and they're starving. Understand this morning that the blessing of obedience is not always bliss, particularly in the short term. The blessing of obedience is not always bliss. Don't you think that surely it crossed Abram's mind, and certainly those that were following him, surely some of them thought, we don't deserve this. We're going where God is leading us. We're doing what God is wanting us to do, and we don't have any food, and we're hungry. What did we do to deserve this? They didn't do anything to deserve it. But let me make a statement to you this morning. It's kind of hard to keep up with, but I'll say it more than once. We don't always deserve what we get, and we don't always get what we deserve. And that's grace. We don't always get what we deserve. We don't get what we deserve. But we also don't always deserve what we get. Sometimes it just happens and God allows it to come. They get where they're going in obedience to God and a famine is hit so they're not done. They must continue their travels to Egypt. I'm sure that some of them said, what in the world is going on? Why are we in the midst of a drought? Have you ever had the sense that God spoke to you, was speaking to you? And that sense of direction, that sense of call is so clear, only to find that that call leads you to a desert. Any of you ever been there? I, I have been there. Following God's, God's call, even when I didn't want to, and yet within 
months of my arrival in obedience, I was in desert-like conditions. I thought, what kind of deal is this? God's call may lead you to a desert, but ultimately he is going to bring you out the other side. It can be discouraging. It, it can be discouraging. We move, it, it, when we're desperately seeking to follow God, we can go through highs and lows. We can go to mountaintop experiences. I love the mountains. Sooner or later, you will see on the big screen pictures of my favorite place on earth with regard to mountains. Those are the Grand Tetons. I need my mountain fix at least once a year so I can stand and gaze at that magnificent creation. But there's valleys in those mountains as well. We move from high to lows. Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River. Where did he soon end up after his baptism? You remember? It ended up in the desert, dealing with the devil. And then we see Abram's humanity in verse 11. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me and will let you live. So say that you are my sister, so that I'll be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. And sure enough, when Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman. When the Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. You see, what is happening in this text is that Abram, the one who has left and gone to follow God in quest of obedience, Abraham waffles a bit with regard to the capacity of the Lord to provide for him everything he needs, including his protection. And Abraham kind of takes care of himself a bit in this passage of the scripture. He's kind of setting up his wife a bit. He places his beautiful wife at risk. And when he, they arrive, his fears become a reality. She's taken to the palace. But Abram is treated well, verse 16, for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, manservants, maidservants, and camels. Abraham lies about his wife, but he gains livestock and servants. He lies. He didn't get what he deserved for lying. The Lord provided and the Lord protects. Because verse 17 tells us the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh in his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summons Abram. What have you done to me, he said? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. Get out of here. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything that he had. Abraham compromised when he took matters into his own hands. And yet by God in his grace, God continues to work in his life and bring blessing to Abraham. God is a God who works in the lives of all of us who do not deserve the grace that he gives us. What did Abram do? What did he have going for him through all of this? Most of all, Abram believed God. And Paul tells us in Romans that because Abram believed God, because he believed God could do what he said he would do, God granted him favor. And he credited his belief, his faith, if you will, he credited that faith to him as righteousness. How does such belief, how does such faith express itself in your life and in mine? Our faith expresses itself in, it, in obedience. 
and we can learn from Abram, the one who leaves and goes. It is an amazing story, and we'll learn more in the weeks that come. I hope you'll continue to go with us through experiencing God as we learn from the story of the lives of characters like Abram as well. We've already mentioned this morning, God's in pursuit of a love relationship with every one of us. In just a moment, David's going to come and lead us as we sing. If you're here this morning and you've not had this encounter, oh, it's not likely to be like Abram. It's much more likely to be a small, still voice, subtle, expressing to you in your heart that you are in the presence of an all-powerful God that really does care about you, and you need him. You need his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You need forgiveness from the sin that is in your life, the stuff pervades your life that God cannot stand the sight of. The invitation is for you to respond today, to come, even if you don't understand it all, come and talk to one of our pastors in just a moment. And if you're here and looking for a place in which to invest your life, I'm only the short-term guy, but come be a part of what God is doing. He's always at work around us. He's at work in the life of the members of this church. May it be more so in the months and years to come. Let's pray. Father, the power of your word. We marvel at the story of the call of Abram. Lord, in a congregation this size today with the spread of ages from the chronologically gifted older to the very young, Lord, there would be some in this congregation this morning that even as I stand here and they sit there, there would be some that are under a sense of conviction wondering what it is you want to do in them and through them. At this moment, but even for the balance of their lives on this earth. And oh God, whether it's at this moment or in the moments to come, days to come, weeks to come, Lord, create a sense in each of us, regardless of our life stage, that, that we want what you want for us. We want you to do in us, and we want you to do through us whatever it is. And God, that we would reach a point where we're willing, as Abram was, to make major adjustments, to step out of our security zones, our places of comfort, if you so lead us to leave and go. God, lead us to the Christ of the cross that we might fall more deeply in love with the one who saves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand as we sing together, church.